Okay, so part one, we talked about using cover coaching, ball mastery as a as part of your team warm up, in addition to dribbling sequences. And just as a reminder, a dribbling sequence is a rhythmic pattern that helps players rapidly develop their dribbling abilities. And the reason why you want to start with ball mastery and dribbling sequences is because as players become more confident with their ability to dribble the ball, this allows them to get their head up and make better decisions, right? better passes, better shots on goal. So I would say after breathing and, and being able to move effectively, so you can see maybe being able to, to learn and then teach an effective warm-up, I would say maybe the most one of the most fundamental skills is dribbling. Right? Have, have players be comfortable with the ball at their feet because then they can be confident and certain on the field. So that's a great place to start. So again, Cover is C-O-E-R-V-E-R. -E Cover Coaching, that's an app, or he's got a YouTube channel. And then Dribbling Sequence, um, the, the one that I grew up on that was taught to be when I was the worst player on my team. And then the following season, I scored more goals than the whole team combined. This is at maybe six or seven years old. Um, the sequence goes with one foot, you go outside, outside, inside, outside, inside. The ball comes across the body and then you repeat it with the other foot. Outside, outside, inside, outside, inside. And why the rhythmic sequence is powerful as well is because as you say it out loud, you say out loud what you're doing as you're doing it. So not only does it establish a mind-body connection, but it helps it helps you it helps players rapidly it helps players I would say develop faster than normal so it's not just a rhythm, rhythmic sequence it's not just a, the pattern but it's also saying it out loud will further help players develop faster than normal okay so you have your warm-up you have your ball mastery warm-up right so team team you know you have your butt your butt kicks and your high knees and your karaoke's and your you know you know some some skips and and sh shoulder you know sh shoulder uh, arm circles forward arm circle circles back however you want to warm the team up then it's ball mastery and then dribbling sequences okay so now we're gonna move on to what I what I'm calling it's it's, this is the training routine from coach Doug Nevins, who is a former Gatorade coach of the year out of West Orange High School. And what he did was when, when he coached our team, he did the same four things every practice. And what I realized in hindsight is that not only were the things he did super effective, which helped us improve, but he did the same, it was the same sequence of events, right? The same four drills every practice. And we actually got better at the practice because we anticipated what would come next right so even so let's say you go to work right you go to work there's different things that happen you know you go to work you you maybe go to the same same place assuming you have a, a location and you're not working remotely but let's assume that you go to a work location it may be the same location but there's nuances and and, and variation every every time at work same thing like his practice routine. There is the same four sequence of events, but even though the same sequence of events and the, dr the drills were the same, there's still so much variation and you could actually create some variation down the line. But let's focus on what, what the sequence is. So every practice it was possession, finishing on goal, crossing and finishing, and then playing to big goals on a small field with your team split up into three, the team that's sitting out circles circles around the field, right? They, they surround the field and they have one touch as neutral players. And, I, and I've been thinking a lot about this. If you could only choose one of the sections, right? If you could only choose out of all these four drills, which one would you, if you could only choose one, which one would you choose? It would have to be playing to big goals on a small field with your team split up into three. And the reason is because not, not only is play fundamental for, for player development, and I, I think 
pe people of all ages, right? Play is essential. But playing to big goals on a small field with your team split up into three raises your competitiveness and it raises the team intensity. Because if you only have two teams that scrimmage against each other and a, a goal is scored, there's nothing gained and nothing lost. Right? There's nothing on the line. There's nothing on the line. So when you when you split the team up into three, what what happens is players who love to play hate to lose and they love to play. They 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 never want to get off the field. So now players start playing for for almost brag for bragging rights. Because if you win, you stay on. So it becomes how many times can you knock off the other team? And this really raises intensity level. So if you could raise the intensity level of your team, you're gonna, and then your, your intensity level during games is higher than any team you face, you're gonna have a great season because it's rare that you're gonna be more intense, you're gonna be more, com more intense than the other team and still lose the game. I would say that's, that's quite rare. The other thing that playing to big goals on a small field helps helps teams do is transition rapidly from offense to defense and defense to offense. A goal should be scored every two to four minutes, probably not even not even four minutes, two, every two to three minutes, because since the goals are so small, if there's a good spell of play, if someone does a nice, uh, uh, you know, makes a nice move, if if a if a player use, loses their mark defensively, there should be there should be a goal scored rapidly. So, you're, it's really not only encouraging speed of play; it's it's encouraging creative decision making on and off the ball. You're utilizing the players who are sitting out because the the team that's sitting out is going to be engaged, even though they only have one touch. They're going to be locked in because they're going to want to get back on the field. So you'll notice that if a player who's on the outside gives the ball to the wrong team, everyone's gonna be harping on them because, because of how intense, how intense this game raises them. So you may feel like you're being outpowered and outgunned by some of these teams who are more developed in their tactics, in their st team strategy, but with this simple formula, you can really elevate and transcend your league because each each thing is gonna, it's, it focuses on the fundamentals of what a team needs to, needs to do to be successful. Teams need to keep the ball, ideally in the other team's half, right? You wanna keep the ball in the other team's half, far away from your goal, and just put as many shots on their goal as possible, right? More shots, more goals. Teams need to be able to finish on goal, right? If you only practice defense, you'll never, it, it's, it, you know, if you, if you don't practice putting the ball in the back of the net, then you're not gonna win a champion, championship you're not going to win a single game if all you do is, is just sit back and defend for 90 minutes. I mean, maybe you could score a goal off counter, but that's besides the point. The point is you've got to be able to finish on goal. So high repetition of, of shots put on goal in the side netting, low and hard. Doug would call this, Coach Nevins would call this Slotsville, right? So from the 18, you take 10 steps. You take 10 steps behind the 18. You have players line up with the ball, and then with no whistle they just go rapid fire on goal low hard driven ball on the ground right that's that's after possession right so possession finishing on goal so so right 10 10 to 15 minutes of finishing on goal whatever you have time for and you tell them make the keeper make a save right you don't want to give the keeper a free save and not even hit the net if if shots on if shots aren't hitting the frame of the net or the goalkeeper isn't making a save make a save, low hard driven balls on the ground. It's called Slotsville. So you do that 10, 15 minutes, rapid fire, right? So when players get in the game, they're not even thinking about it, right? They, they, they run, run straight to the goal and they just smash, they, they laser that laser that ball low hard on the ground, right in the side netting. And then you do crossing and finishing. You start at, you start at the halfway line, four lines, two crossing lines that are alternating, then two lines about uh, on either side of the semicircle, right? So two in the middle, two on the outside. So let's say the right side line starts, 
it's a slightly curved run slightly curved because you want them you want it easy for them to cross the ball to the 18 and then the players in the middle they do a crisscross run right they make an x and then they finish on goal one touch and then the left side goes left side dribbles up cross the ball and then two players in the, in the middle t follow behind slightly finish on goal and then right depending on how many balls you have or right players got to fetch the ball out of the net or beyond the net if they miss the frame you gotta you might have to reset the balls to the to the cr finish uh, to the crossing lines a couple times right because players got to get the ball the players got to get reorganize the ball so you might have to balance line balance lines but you want to rotate right rotate crossing lines rotate finishing lines and a lot of repetitions right it's it's like rapid fire no whistle just have the players go when they're ready finish on goal cross it finish it cross it finish it cross it finish it so it's clockwork when the game comes and then you go right into you go right into playing you bring the goals in close if you don't have access to big goals you could do two you know you, you could do or you let's say you only have access to one big goal so you do one big goal right let's say you only have one keeper you could do sweeper keepers you can you can have one big goal with one keeper and then the, t the goal that doesn't have a keeper you make two you spread out two uh, gates or you use pug goals or let's say you have no keepers and you have t two teams and the last player back can use their hands right Ro roman keeper sweeper keeper if you have odd numbers you can have the best player who's usually the center midfielder maybe the forward but you just have them play you have them throw a, a, pin, a pinny on and they're neutral and they, they are, they're on the field the whole time and they never get off they're just neutral and they're just neutral and they play with every single team because that really helps them develop as a center midfielder so I think the biggest mistake that coaches make during that during playing the big goals is the field is will be too big right like I said it should be a goal should be scored every two to three minutes if that Right, rapid transitions from offense to defense, defense to offense, a lot of shots on goal. So it's it's very game like. It's very game like. You want to raise that intensity. You really encourage when someone makes a great play. You really want to vocalize. Say, you know, great pass or great shot on goal. Just a lot of shots on goal, so that when it comes to the game, and you win the ball, any you, you win possession of the ball, players are automatically right. It's boom, boom, transition from defense to offense. Swing it up the line, cross it, and finish on goal. It's like it's just so that practice, your practice routine, translates directly into um, into just having a lot of fun in the field because because it's just essentials. And I, I uh, over I uh, I didn't talk about possession at all. When I say possession, what I mean is you have two different you have split your team up into. Let's say you call it two two teams. Unlimited touch in the beginning, right? I think you said these these boys are U10 or U11, so right, unlimited touch to start. And you have let's say you have shirts and then you have pennies. So four passes. Let's say you say you got to keep the ball away from the other team. You got to possess the ball away from the other team for four passes is a point, and first team to five wins. And you want to have them count. It. What's up, chef? You want to have them count out their. You want to have them count out their. Their passes, right? So, you know, they connect a pass and everyone's screaming out one, two, three. And then sometimes they'll try and count a pass that may or may not connect, and then the other team will say, "No, that doesn't count. That doesn't count," right? So, so uh, that's one example of a possession game, and there's some other ones, but this is this is that's that's basically it, and you want to have your possession game not too large right you want to have a tight area to do possession because what you're doing is having players really maximizing the space which forces them to be more creative with their movement and their their play and let's say they start to really get good at this game then you could start to restrict their touch count so it'd be like you say okay now it's instead of unlimited touch it's you players have two touch one in the takeover one on the takeover means when one team gains back possession from the other team, right? Let's say they, they steal it. There's a 
there's a misplay, they take, they take it away, then you have a plus one touch. So it's so they play out from the other team, and then they, they play out from the other team, and then they have two more touches. And then at the highest level of this, the game looks like you could say players have one touch with one on the takeover. But, you know, the only time that I played that with Coach Nevins was when we were ranked U18 PDA Cruyff boys in 2008. We were ranked the number one team in the country, and we lost in regionals against FC Delco out of Pennsylvania. So pe people have criticized, criticized me for this routine. Some people say it's um, some coaches, you know, every, every coach has their, has their gets, starts to form, formulize how they like to run a practice session. So some people say that this session is too, is too simple or some people say it's, um, what, what was someone saying? They were criticizing my substitution strategy. You know, there are a lot of criticisms, but this isn't, this isn't for a professional team. This isn't for, you know, this is, this is not a practice routine that you'd use for the, the U.S. national team. But this is something that you can really rely on because it's so simple, and that's what makes it profound. Because you're not you you don't have to read ten you know hundreds of s soccer textbooks to really get a lot of bang for your buck utilizing this strategy. It's possession, finish on goal, crossing and finishing, and then playing to big goals in a small field with your team split up into three, all the players surrounding on the outside. If you can do that, if you can understand that, and you can execute that, and just encourage your team. You're, you're really going to have a lot of fun, and I think you're going to lose less games. You're going to have less blowouts, and it, you're going to notice that the practice routine, people will start to get more excited for practice, which will lead to better, better results in the game, right? Because it just raises joy and intensity and competition so that I think it's going to start to lead to you to have better seasons. So hopefully some of these ideas help reach out with any questions. All right, thank you.